Ordinarily, you would think, well, you bury steam piping to insulate it, and I mean, use the, the earth to your advantage, not on a military base, okay? Because you're expecting it. not today. Nowadays, they hit you with a, a warhead that'll wipe out the whole base. But <laughs> in the old days, they didn't have really high explosives like that. So the other thing, I used to wonder, well, why do they do these things? And it wasn't until I came to college I realized, and no one actually told me, I just, one day I was thinking, oh, thermal expansion. Okay. Uh, and I've had a number of failures over the years where people forgot to put it in thermal expansion joints. Uh, so it's a common problem. Okay, so what questions about base stuff? Or did you ask those while you were getting your breakfast? No questions? Both of these were good presentations for you to hear about uh, what other people have gone through. Um, well, let's see. Um, you, you talked about, well actually, out of both of these, I was thinking, thinking of the stainless steel one. There's something called corrosion under insulation, uh, which if you take a corrosion course, they'll call it uh, under deposit attack or um, crevice corrosion or something, but what you call it lagging, but anytime you put insulation around something, if that insulation gets wet, and moisture gets in there, you have a perfect little environment if the moisture gets left in there to create a nice concentration or a corrosion cell. Um, and it's in carbon steel, it's not so bad, so it goes for 20, 25 years, um, and before something really bad might start happening. But in stainless steel, it can really be bad. I had a, a situation, um, the company that makes Manwich, you know, the stuff you mix with the ground beef, right? okay. they were making Manwich. And it turns out you have to, uh, if you shut the system down, you have to keep your product above 200 degrees Fahrenheit or you have to scrap it, just throw out all that food. Okay, now the pigs will eat it. You know, but but, uh, um, but uh, they don't like to do that. So they had a, a jack that had this hot water tank, basically. And they people designed these things such that it was a 100 gallon hot water tank and it was not to operate above 212 degrees. In fact, it was supposed to operate at 210 degrees Fahrenheit. But it had to be operating between 200 and 210 because you had to keep the product above 200 or you're gonna have to scrap it, okay, because of where you're doing maintenance. Well, every day they had to disinfect. This was a, um, a plant with food and they had to disinfect. So what did they use? Bleach. Sodium hypochlorite, right? It kills bugs. It also corrodes stainless steel like, like gangbusters, okay? Uh, my mother-in-law, when she lived with us, um, she lived with us for 17 years until she passed away, but she one night decided she wanted, she used to always want to clean the dishes, okay? So I let her do it, even though it irritated me no end that. See her turn the hot water on and let it run for the next hour and a half. Okay? <laughs> but nonetheless, cheaper than a maid, I guess. But anyway, one night she didn't have that many things, so she decided to put the stainless steel dinnerware, the little bit she had, in some some bleach to sanitize it rather than to put run the dishwasher. Well, overnight, an oxygenated chloride environment will pit stainless steel in 24 hours. So we had these big pits in that wow. part of the stainless steel. So I, that time I had to buy some new stainless uh, from dinnerware. Uh, but it, it's amazing how well it will work. Well, so they, they have insulation and lagging around this hot water tank, and they've been washing it down with the dilute bleach for on a regular basis until one day, and part of the problem was the controller. It wasn't really quite clear if it was really maintaining things below two below 212 or if it had gotten a little bit above. But in any case, it blew up and it, it killed someone. I mean, you got a bunch of hot water uh, under some pressure and it expands and anybody in the area, the same thing that happened to the people on the U of U. Okay. Um, so corrosion under lagging. So when you talked about in the reason I asked the stainless steel, uh, you mentioned something about... I, I should know what kind of paper. Wait, no, Probably 304. Charging system on carrier. It's 304. Mm -hmm. 304 stainless. But we'll get to that later. But I mean, stainless steel is a serious problem because you get stress corrosion cracking. Okay. Carbon steel, you don't get stress corrosion cracking, but you'll get general corrosion. Now, one of the problems the Navy has is 
originally, back in the 1950s, they built the ship to last 30 years. By the 1980s, they were starting to push them out to 40 years. And now, one of you actually even said it, 25, you said go for another 25, I think you said eight, right? People are looking at 50 years for a ship. Do they actually have, a, is the fort the new hull that replaces mm -hmm. the Nimitz? They have someone finally, after 15 years, took the bullet and spent $15 million. Have they built ships out of it? There's one, it's still in progress. There's one floating now. Mm -hmm. still yeah, it's in the water, but consummation. So they have built one. Okay. 2016 blue Okay, fine. So they finally did build the new <laughs> hulls. Um, they just couldn't afford it. The Nimitz came in the way every year. Um, in any case, the uh, so is the Ford a heavier displacement than the Nimitz? The Nimitz was getting up of over 95,000 pounds. I think it's over 100, 100, 110. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. So I know it's, it's definitely like larger, but I think it's also heavier. Yeah, okay. In any case, um, where's that going? Oh, the, so anyway, they, they decided, they've decided to extend the, the life of the ships, and as they've done that, there was sort of a transition region there in the 1990s where they haven't re hadn't replaced all the piping with more corrosion resistant piping, but carbon steel piping, you could let it go for 30 years and you could have enough original thickness and the general corrosion you would get. Well, after 30 years, you just scrap it. But people who were taking care of these ships in the 90s and 2000s, um, these ships that had been built for 30 years of, of life they were just replacing carbon steel all over the place. And that's why they've gone to titanium and Linnell and other things. And seawater piping on, on the new ships, are they still carbon steel? Probably not. But anyway, you're not gonna get 50 years out of carbon steel. You're gonna have to come in and replace the whole piping system, which on the ship, you know, paint. Uh, so there's some thoughts there. Um, I can't think of it. Okay. Uh, let's, you want to start videotaping? Okay, we're on? Oh, sure. so, okay, that's fine. Okay, so what I'm doing right now is I want to just, we talked enough about hydrogen for a little bit, but I, there were a couple of points that I basically am taking things out of, and this is on your, on Stellar, but this is out of John Lippold's book on welding metallurgy, and actually he's got a very good chapter on hydrogen and brittle, okay? Um, and there's, what basically happens is the hydrogen goes to the crack tip. I think I've discussed this, I haven't shown any picture. But you have a triaxially stressed region, and that's why it's delayed cracking. It takes hydrogen time to diffuse to the tip of the crack. It concentrates at the tip of the crack, and it embrittles it. And I told you, people have taken videos. They polish the crack tip, look at it in the microscope, charge it with the hydrogen in a corrosion process, and then they just stretch it in the microscope. And you can see the hydrogen bubbles coming right out of this crack tip. Yep. So this is the last week when we had the video, and we could really we could literally see the hydrogen coming out. Yep. And uh, we talked about how, you know, uh, it's a very rapid process by which the hydrogen kind of leaves the yep. and how's that cracking. So this is apparently a, a slower, so where's the hydrogen coming from? It is a slow process. This crack propagation of hydrogen. Well, no, this is all occurring within a couple of days. Okay, so this is still okay. rapid. This is okay. it's still rapid. On an atomic scale, the, the diffusivity, well, we might as well go through the numbers. Sometimes it's worth going through numbers. Um, if I, well, actually, it's, it's right here. No, it's not this one. Uh, but I put up some things that show at uh, room temperature, the diffusivity of hydrogen is about 10 to minus 5 centimeters squared per second. And it turns out, a guy named Albert Einstein kind of looked at all the diffusion equations. You got the diffusion equation for viscosity, okay? And that's called an obvious Stokes equation, okay? You've got it for mass, which is uh, fixed laws of diffusion, mass diffusion. You've got it for heat diffusion, which is Fourier's law of heat, of, of heat diffusion. Those were all in the 19th century. This guy Einstein comes along and he says, well, these are all just diffusion processes and if you look at the math, and I actually took in graduate school a full course in the math department. And all we did was look at the diffusion equation. And Einstein showed, and sometimes it's called the Einstein number, uh, that you can have a dimensionless number, if you're talking about mass diffusivity, 
it's d squared over, or no, it's uh, x squared over dt, where d is the diffusivity. If you're talking about uh, Fourier's law, it's x squared over alpha t, where alpha is the thermal diffusivity. Okay? And obviously, it gets a little messier with viscosity and convection and things like that, but it's still, you can talk about the diffusion of shear stress. Okay? And if you don't have any convection, you'll end up with a similar formula. Uh, but all three of these things, um, uh, momentum, which is Navier Stokes, mass, or heat, can all be described by a diffusion equation. But the argument of the diffusion equation is always going to be of the form x squared over dt or alpha t or whatever. And that is dimensionless, because d is centimeters squared per second times time, is centimeters squared divided, by, divided into centimeters squared, it's dimensionless. Okay, so if I have 10 to the minus 5 centimeters squared per second, and I want to know how long it takes for hydrogen to go one millimeter, which is a tenth of a centimeter, and I square that, I get 0.01 as a distance over 10 to the minus 5 times time, and time, that implies that time is equal to 10 to the third, right? 1,000 seconds, three hours, or no, a third of an hour, 20 minutes, for hydrogen to diffuse one millimeter. Is this supposed to be equal to one? Yeah, if, if the national quantity is equal to one. Yeah, okay. set it equal to one. Actually, in a lot of the forms of the equation, there might be a four here, there might be a pi here. Um, there's different depending on the geometry of what you're looking at. There are whole books written by mathematicians, once crank, Mathematics of Diffusion. And it's just solutions to the diffusion equation in different geometries. Plates, thick plates, thin plates, infinite plates, cylinders, spheres, okay? Um, uh, and then there's another one, Carswell and Jaeger wrote theirs of conduction of heat and solids, and it's just the same, same math. Uh, crank was for mass diffusion, and these were about 50 or 60 year old books. But mathematicians can solve this, and that's where you get into that's where I learned about what a Bessel function is, okay? And the, the solution of the diffusion equation in cylindrical coordinates or spherical coordinates gives you Bessel functions, okay? Thin plates give you an infinite series. These are the types of things you guys are learning about now. So you, I could be teaching you all that stuff. <laughs> Go back to my youth, okay? But in any case, if I multiply by four, so it's an hour and a half rather than 20 minutes. I'm like, who cares, okay? The point is, it takes time for hydrogen to diffuse a millimeter, okay? Well, a millimeter's not very deep. Let's say I have a piece of steel that is two inches thick. That means to get to the surface, the stuff in the middle has to diffuse one inch, which is 25 millimeters. Square 25, this is 625. Okay, it's 25 times 25 is 625. And now this becomes um, uh, 6.25 times an hour and a half. Okay, now a four inch thick plate, it's going as the square of the distance. And now it's going to take a whole day for something inside a four inch thick plate. And so it turns out when they were doing some of the foundations on the Seawolf and things, they could put in half an inch of weld metal, and they have to stop. And make sure they keep the preheat on for like three or four hours, just to allow the hydrogen out, before you put more on top. Okay, and if you're doing armor steel back in World War II, that's 17 inches thick, they had to go slow, actually they had to go slow, they went slow anyway, because they had stick electrodes, and they weren't pausing metal that quickly. But if you didn't allow time for the hydrogen to diffuse out, you'd have a problem. I can't remember, oh, it was the, uh, the Four River Bridge where Quincy Shipyard used to build, be. Uh, the state of Massachusetts is building a, a new, uh, uh, what do you call it, bridge? The drawbridge. The drawbridge. And they got some, like, I think it's shivs that are eight inches thick of a high strength steel, 
highly alloyed, very difficult to weld. And I told him, you got to stop every half inch for two hours and diffuse the hydrogen out. I said, what? Because these people never heard of going to very thick steel. You've got to stop to give time for the hydrogen to get out of there. Otherwise, you just trap it. Okay? It'll be trapped forever if you start going through the diffusion equation. You're not going to get it out of there. You're going to get cracks before it all happens. So um, you have to worry about steel thickness as well. Part of the problem, uh, and I think I, I think I told you that these, these people would call me and say, "Well, uh, we want to weld such and such. And how do we do it?" And I always say, "What's the composition? What's the thickness? Those are the two things I needed to know." Okay. Now, another thing that we talked about, and we're going to go over again, is this microstructure, tensile strength, and stress, and hydrogen. Here's a nice thin diagram that tells you. Um, uh, what, what the situation is in terms of if you want to shrink each one of these circles so that you don't get an inter intersection where everything's going to crack. Now we have uh, this one. This is actually a plot that tells you how much hydrogen you can expect from different welding processes. If you go to some of the books on welding steel without hydrogen uh, cracking, this is weld hydrogen level in millimeters milliliters per 100 grams of well deposit. Essentially within 10%, this is the same number as parts room per million of hydrogen in the steel deposit. Here's your shield and metal arc, these stick electrodes. Way up here, even with two tenths of, this is percent moisture here, even with two tenths of percent moisture, which is the lowest level you can get, you're gonna be up around um, the potential is well over 100 parts per million, but in fact, if you have your preheat and everything, you can still get things down on below four, okay, parts per million, typically. Uh, basic, uh, well, uh, these are baked electrodes at 350 to 450 C, uh, titanium dioxide electrodes or lime electrodes, different types of coatings. You can be much higher and you'll get much higher, like 10 parts per million or even 20 parts per million um, hydrogen, and you're gonna get cracking. This will crack HY80. Some of this will crack HY80. Uh, uh, if you really wanna do HY100, you should be down in this range. We have flex cord arc welding. They build bridge, bridges. I remember an electric boat that broadened. I was down here 25 years ago and they built a new kind of administration building where the cafeteria is, right, right on the, the road there. And I, they took me to lunch, a couple of welding engineers. I said, pretty nice building. They said, yeah, it was welded with flux core, so it built jump up and down, okay? Uh, flux core is a high, it's a solid wire process, similar to gas metal arc, except that there's not, it's not solid wire. The wire is hollow too and inside it has some of that flux. So here are the flux is on the outside, here are the flux is on the inside. Much more productive process, also can be fairly high in hydrogen. The lowest high hydrogen is gas metal arc. This is what you typically use to pick it on the whole of the ships now. It's not true 30 years ago, but today mostly gas metal arc. And you can get fairly low hydrogen because it's only coming from grease and moisture or lubricant on the wire and places like that. So, we keep pushing for better and better controls, which Nate was talking about. Yeah. For gas metal arc, the wire is speeding through the uh, same place the spark's coming from? Yeah. Um, you actually have a little nozzle, a copper tip that has a hole in it, and you have a wire feeder, a little spool of wire, and you got some rollers pushing it through this little nozzle, and the arc is struck to that wire. Just like, you know, this is a non-continuous wire, but on gas metal arc, they could have a 100-pound drum of wire. I've seen it where it's like the tungsten bit and they're hand-feeding in That's wire. gas tungsten arc. So is that in the same part of the... That's even lower than gas metal arc, okay? okay. Because you, but um, much slower. I've got, a, I've got something in here that has the... Deposition rates. I was just wondering if it's the same spot on that chart as 
gas metal or you can think of it as the same spot as gas metal. I mean it okay. sort of sort of overlaps as far as that goes. Yeah. In terms of potential hydrogen. Okay. Now we haven't gotten into it yet, but uh, there's lots of formulas for what we call carbon equivalent. Um, carbon equivalent is a measure of the hardenability. So you take all these alloying elements and you know carbon will give you hardness and alloying elements give you hardenability. Well, for welding, we people talk about carbon equivalent. And over the last 80 years, there are lots of different formulas. This is not all of them. Okay, Which is the right one to use? Well, this was developed for high strength low alloy steels. Okay, it's got niobium and vanadium in it, but so that's how they get the strength of, in the low alloy. Um, but everybody wants to come up with their own thing um, in terms of carbon equivalent. We're going to go through the American Welding Society code and show you the carbon equivalent they use. Okay. Are the fractions just representing like one, you know, one part carbon? And one thirtieth part silicon or whatnot, or the fraction. Silicon's one thirtieth is effective at hardening steel, as carbon is. I see. Silicon will add hardness to steel, similar to carbon, but at one at only three percent of it is effective. Okay. Yeah. So you can get great depth of hardening, which is hardenability, but this is a measure of carbon equivalent. How much hardness can you get by adding? You also get hardness when you add these other alloys. They don't just give depth, they also give an increase in the <coughs> hardness. Okay, uh, but it's all, they're all empirical formulas. Everybody wants to own their own empirical formula. This is what I really wanted to get to, because we haven't really talked about it. This is hydrogen-free samples. This is the notch tensile strength. So it's like ripping a piece of paper. You got a little notch you put in your steel as a function of temperature. It turns out, right here at room temperature, is the greatest embrittlement of hydrogen. I mentioned before that if you wanted to measure the hydrogen in the steel in the laboratory, you'll quench it and put it in liquid nitrogen because it takes forever. You're slowing this D is now down to 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9 in liquid nitrogen. And you can hold it for three or four days before you do your chemical analysis and still measure your hydrogen. Okay, because you can get three or four orders of magnitude slower diffusion. At higher temperatures, you're going to find that the stuff diffuses out more quickly. Okay, at, at um, 250 degrees, I got the data here somewhere. It's, I showed the, the diffusivity data before, but it might be 10 to the minus 4 at 250 degrees with a preheat. And so the hydrogen is diffusing out more rapidly. Turns out nature has it that room temperature is absolutely the worst. Okay, isn't that wonderful? Okay, so that's just the way it is, and we have to live with it. But uh, why, in this graph, uh, when you go a higher temperature, yep. uh, it looks like it's increasing the strength, do you say? No, well, the strength, this is a brittleness test. And so hydrogen free samples are not, oh, why is it increasing with temperature? Mm -hmm. um, I suppose that's the way to be true. I don't know if there's really good data for that. Okay. He may have had data, but he may have actually had a little bit of hydrogen inside you know, free samples or whatever. Just scatter around this thing. And I bet the scatter is as, as great as the slope. Okay. But there is definitely a difference here. I mean, there's an order of magnitude difference. You can lose 75% of your strength due to hydrogen and brittle. Okay. So all of a sudden your design, which was good for 50% of the strength, is two times overloaded in terms of embrittlement. So we do have to worry about it. So now let me give you an example <coughs> of this uh, in the last couple of minutes that we have of this Venn diagram. And this is one of my earliest, um, this is microstructure. This is uh, stress, and this is hydrogen, and I want to avoid that. So I was like 28 or 29 years old. I was a young faculty member, couldn't afford to feed my family. You remember what it was like when you were there, right? Um, and, well, you won't remember? 
Oh, I remember. <laughs> I wasn't an infant, but I couldn't afford to feed my family when I was 28. Okay, not on the salary of an assistant professor. Um, and so I, I got a phone call from what used to be the Boston Navy Yard. We no longer have such a thing other than, I guess, the Constitution. But uh, uh, and it wasn't there at the Constitution in Charleston. It was actually downtown somewhere else. Um, and they had a destroyer. It was supposed to go out in one week. And for six weeks, they've been trying to weld pro-Molly tubing in the steam system to stainless steel. And the Navy spec said you must use an Inconel nickel-based filler metal. Uh, and they have been trying. They've had people come up to the Philadelphia Navy Yard, some Navy welders. They tried, and they kept on getting cracked. Okay, this was just a, a little one-inch tube of stainless steel, and they had a, a joint. This okay. it was a, oh, a J groove. Okay, I machined a little just like that, and they had to make it in the vertical position because uh, that's the way the tubes were in the, in the destroyer. And they had to put in a root pass. And whenever they tried to do it with ink and L, they got a crack. And they found they could do it with stainless steel. This was stainless steel to chromolic steel, two and a quarter chrome, one molly, which is a, a high temperature steel for, for steam systems. <coughs> stainless steel is even higher temperature, but this is just a transition joint. Every time they tried it, they got cracked. And they tried preheating, they tried all kinds of things, and they couldn't get it to work. So they called me, and I was only in my late 20s, and I needed the money, so I, they said, we want you to come down and tell the Navy why we should be able to do this with stainless steel and not nickel alloy. And I didn't know, hey, I'm an engineer. I never run into this before. So I, I stay a little bit late. I used to try to get home at 5 o'clock to be with my little kids when they went to bed. And I stay late, and I go to the library, and I find an article in the Welding Journal. Ten years later, if you weld it with stainless steel, it's going to crack on you because the carbon will diffuse around. It will form some carbides uh, with some of the things that are in, in the uh, stainless steel, and you'll get something that Whipple has got a new name for it that I haven't heard before. Um, but it's basically a long-term heating when you're at temperature in the, in the uh, ship. Over time, the carbon will diffuse and you'll get cracking. So I knew I couldn't come and tell the Navy, just forget your spec, you know, it's okay to, to use stainless steel and they'll, they'll be able to get it out of the yard. So I come down and I have a copy of the paper with me and I meet with them in the, in the conference room. And they didn't even tell me who all the people in the room were, but I said, well, you can't, you can't, uh, you're gonna have to be able to think it out, just like the spec says, uh, but let's talk about how, wh why you're having problems. And they showed me, and I, I asked them questions about all these things. <coughs> the the well, they had, they had checked the composition of moisture in the shielding gas. They had, couldn't do much about the microstructure. This, you know, this was hard chrome molly steel to stainless with a filler metal in between, and that's what the Navy had. The only thing I could think of uh, in this half hour, 45 minute discussion is I was quizzing them and they were quizzing me, and they weren't real happy because I wasn't just willing to write letters to the Navy saying, oh, it's okay, no, no problem. Um, what we pay this guy for anyway? Yeah. <laughs> so, I said, well, tell you what, why don't you try, instead of a joint groove that looks like that, why don't you machine one that looks like this, so that when you weld it, you'll be putting your root pass in here rather than putting a root pass in here, and getting a, a big bead right here, and that, that will reduce your stress because you have some flexibility, blah, 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 and um, I said, well, okay, we'll, we'll try that. I said, goodbye. Let me know how it works out. And they said, oh, no, we'll do it while you're here. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and so 
we go out and they take a couple of pieces of pipe, they put them on the lathe, they machine it. The guy asks me, oh, you've got enough of a, a, a lathe there that, yeah, it's just a little more. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so then they go and they do a TIG weld. That's what you do on pipe, you typically TIG it with a root pass. They be slow, it's very good high quality weld. They do the TIG weld and then they have to let it slow cool. They wrap it in insulation to let it slow cool, to allow the hydrogen to come out. This is all in the Navy spec. And so we're standing around for 45 minutes while it's cooling down. And the whole time, the foreman who did the machining and did the welding, they say, this is not going to work, this is not going to work. And this guy's got 40 years experience, so I got four years experience, you know, uh, who's going to be right? Uh, I was just thinking, look at my watch, saying, isn't there somewhere I have to be? Uh, so uh, then he takes the insulation off and it's cooled down, and he takes the dye penetrant. First of all, he has to clean it with the dye penetrant solvent, sprays that on, you know, set dry a little bit for a couple minutes, then he sprays on the uh, uh, the penetrant. you got to let that penetrate for five minutes. Okay, so, oh, it's not going to work, not going to work. And I'm sitting there, oh. uh, And then he finally holds it up and he sprays the white coat the bell on. He's turning it around. No price. Mm -hmm. I walked out a hero. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know if they got the ship out on time. I just got my $400 or whatever. <laughs> um, but, but, I could have walked out and I, mean, I had no idea, except I didn't know the fundamentals. And I knew I could, they were doing as good a job. I quizzed them about the whole getting rid of the hydrogen, no grease, no moisture in your shielding gas. They checked all those things. What about, well, the microstructure was going to be whatever it was. And this is how we had to use it. The only thing I could think of is how do I lower the stress, and that was how I did it. It was sort of a shot in the dark, and it worked. And that's just the immense stress of the, the structure of the, of the metal, right? Right, right. right. Yeah. And then, actually, once you got the root pass in, I think the spec allowed you to use uh, something else afterwards or whatever. But they, they knew that if they put in final passes, it was just that root pass, they couldn't get crack free, okay? And by just changing the joint geometry. So this actually gets to the point of if the only tool you have is a hammer, you see every problem is a nail. The people would come up from Philadelphia, everybody knew how to get the hydrogen down, and, um, but then everybody thought of it as a welding metallurgy problem. Well, it didn't get solved as welding metallurgy, it got well, solved as a welding uh, residual stress problem. Okay. Uh, so, anyway, so one of my early successes that I had no idea how it was going to work out. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to keep hold. Okay. Thanks. See you tomorrow.